Okay, so good time of the day, everyone. Welcome to the keynote session. Today, we have the pleasure to host Christian Kastner, which is an associate professor of Carnegie Mellon University, where he's also the director of the software engineering PhD program, which we will be delivering a keynote on the topic of rethinking the role of software engineering for machine learning. And his research uh, originally focused on software analysis with specific focus on highly configurable system, and is also uh, investigating sustainability of open source software and community. Uh, it mostly use data science methods and tools, and um, for example, as for predicting configuration option change, the performance of software system, or for modeling the benefit of donation in open source projects, uh, and is also um, interested in investigating research and collaboration, documentation, and quality assurance in teams where software engineers and data science interact towards building AI-enabled system. And it also teaches a new course on machine learning in production at the intersection of software engineering and machine learning. So I'm very eager to listen to this uh, keynote. And I uh, will just um, now give the stage to Christian. And I would like to thank him again for accepting our invitation to um, give this talk. Thank you. Oh, right. by the way, before we start, just a quick uh, logistic. Uh, you will be posting questions in the chat since it's not possible to unmute yourself. So we will be addressing the question at the end of the talk. If you have the, if there is some question that you would like to ask, you would like to support, you could also use the like and the emoji so we can prioritize questions. So and then I guess Christian will be happy to handle your question at the end of the talk. Sorry for interrupting you, Christian. The stage That's is fine. yours. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Um, Right, so in this talk, I'm trying to convince you that we as software engineers should assert a more dominant role in building products with machine learning components. We should really shift from thinking about the model to thinking about entire systems. So I'm giving it all away in the beginning. I'm trying to convince you of these four points in this talk. We need a system-wide view of software engineers when we build products with machine learning components. And software engineers should be the one that drive responsible engineering or ethical AI in these products. And the software engineers are essential to facilitate collaboration between disciplines. And the way to achieve all of this, I think, is through education. And we should teach this. So. I'm going to start with a very brief motivation because I assume you all are familiar with this anyway. Um, so we have made ma massive advances in machine learning. Here's a picture of the conference center where ICSI is going to be next week. And an object detection model can detect fairly precisely what's in these images. This was unheard of 20, 25 years ago, right? We have made massive advances. But in a sense, we don't really care about object detection in itself unless we're trying to win a machine learning competition, but we want to build products with this. On the more ambitious side, we might try to build self-driving cars, right? We have been trying this for many years. And object detection might happen in there, for example, for detecting pedestrians, detecting street signs, detecting traffic lights, and so on. But we also use object detection in more, more mundane products. Think about a photo sharing site like Google Photos. It traditionally, doesn't need a lot of machine learning, but they use it for search. They run object detection in the background to detect what's it's in images. So I can search for people, I can search for objects, and so on. That's how I find my vaccine card these days if I need to show this to somebody, right? This is a really cool feature that uses machine learning in the background to build a real product. But it seems to be really hard to build products with machine learning components. Building software is hard already, but we see lots of reports, you can believe them to the degree that you want, but it seems to be really hard to get from a prototype, a promising model, to a product that seems to work reliably. And we have a high potential for causing harm. Right? whether we're killing people, whether it's discrimination. And we should be fair here. We caused harm with software before. We didn't need machine learning for this. But this seems to be something here that's pushing us further and causing more potential for harm. And through this, throughout this entire talk, I'm going to talk about how software engineers can help building products with machine learning, sometimes called software engineering for machine learning. I'm not going to talk about machine learning for software engineering, which mostly focuses on developer tools, bug finding, like in these images, auto completion, program repair, or helping students to cheat on assignments. Right? I'm going to focus exclusively on how to build products and how that changes with machine learning in it. 
And I want to argue that we really need to shift from models to systems in our thinking. Data science and machine learning traditionally is very model-centric. We focus on how can we get the most accurate model for a task. And we often think about this as these pipelines uh, where we go from model requirements through some data collection, labeling, cleaning, feature engineering, training, and evaluation. And in the typical software engineering course or book, we focus on the latter stages. It's still very iterative, but it often starts with here you're given some data, often some benchmark, and now you're either learning how the machine learning algorithm works or you're using it to build the most accurate model, but you almost never go out and then use the model for anything. You never build a product in these kind of courses. There's some discussion here, software engineering, how it can help building better tools in this pipeline, helping with versioning. A lot of this research happens actually in the HCI community, but this is all very much focused on building models. When you actually try to deploy models, people have realized very quickly that this is very complex. There's lots of extra complexity. Um, this very well-known paper, Hidden Technical Debt and Machine Learning, showed that the machine learning code, so the TensorFlow code or the scikit-learn code that you're writing to train a model is tiny in comparison to all the infrastructure that you're building around it for serving the model, monitoring, and so on. This paper has first been published about eight years ago, and a lot of things have changed since then. So a lot of these boxes have probably shrunken because for a lot of these things, infrastructure now exists, open source libraries and so on. If you want to serve a model now, you pick one of the many libraries, get an AWS account, and you can do this with two or three lines of code. But still, there's a lot of complexity here and a lot of investment in making this stuff easier. So in the pipeline, we've seen extra steps about model deployment, model monitoring, and a lot of focus here under the umbrella of ML ops or automating the entire pipeline that you can train this in again and again and again. And there's, again, a lot of software engineering kind of skills that go into this, like automation, CICD kind of things. Um, but again, all of this is very model-centric. All of this is there to publish a model that might be used in a product. If you think about the product as a whole, let's take the photo gallery here, the model that we're producing with the entire pipeline is one component among many other components in the software system. But we have many non-machine learning components and some machine learning components in here. If we're diving in a little bit deeper, it gets a little bit more complicated. We have the pipeline that trains the model, then the inference service that deploys the model, model monitoring in there, and some other components. But in the end, these are still components in a larger system, achieving the goal of the product in the end. And here, this is an architecture diagram of a self-driving car where we have about 20 models all interacting, but also including many non-machine learning components, and they all need to work together in some so in the end, this is about building systems, systems consisting of multiple components, machine learning and non-machine learning components, and how the system interacts with the environment, how it interacts with the real world. And this is something that software engineers are traditionally quite good at thinking about, right? How do we build systems? How do we decompose systems into components? How do we assure them? How do we think about interactions with the environment and make sure that things are safe? So what's actually different here? Is this just normal software engineering, and we just have machine learning components in there? Well, there are certain things that change with machine learning when we introduce machine learning into a software system. And we could talk about this for a while. There are a couple of different uh, things here, but I think the key thing that changes everything downstream is that a machine learned model is essentially an unreliable function. From a software engineering sense, it has a very simple interface, like object detection takes a model, gets you a list of objects. Very simple interface, but we can't really rely on this working correctly all the time. There are no guarantees. The model may make mistakes, and we're usually okay with that to some degree. We may get confidence scores, but they are usually unreliable. And how the model works internally, how this function works internally is typically inscrutable, opaque. We can't really understand it. We evaluate the entire thing, not in terms of correctness, but in terms of accuracy. And that's really important, and I want to dive into this a little bit more. So in traditional software engineering, 
we pretend that we always have good specifications, at least in education we do. We almost never have formal specifications like shown here, but at least we have some description. And these specifications are important because they allow us to divide and conquer. They allow us to decompose the product into components, the components into functions, and then test each of these individually with unit testing and put them together without too much hassle. It, and our traditional testing strategy heavily relies on specification. We, pro, we write tests that write, provide some inputs, check against expected outputs. And if any of our many tests fail, we tend to say we found a bug. The implementation doesn't correspond to the specification and hopefully somebody is going to fix it. With machine learning, that's kind of weird. It's very hard to describe what these functions are really doing. We can give some vague descriptions in terms of what a human would do, or this is what on average of some training data happened, but we can't really precisely specify what's going to happen. And so also testing in the traditional sense falls apart. We wouldn't write a lot of different tests for individual images and then say if any of those tests fail, the model is incorrect, right? It's broken, it doesn't meet the specification. We're actually okay if a model is 95% accurate, right? If 5% of our tests in a way fail. We don't even think about this as unit tests in the same way. So that's a fundamental difference. I think one good way to think about this is a saying that all models are wrong. This is used in many communities, including formal methods. It originally comes from statistics, but I think it applies here too. All models are approximations. It contains assumptions that are never exactly true. All models are wrong, but some models are useful. So the question you need to ask is not, is this model true or is this correct? It never is, and we don't even know what correctness might even mean. But is this model good enough for this particular application? Right? So it's much more about fit or usefulness of a model than about correctness. This aligns with a fundamental shift of different reasoning. In computer science, we're educated with deductive reasoning, the mathy style of reasoning, where we have formulas and we can reason about implications and so on. So we're reasoning about combinations of logical statements, we prove things. That's why we can de decompose systems. That's why unit testing works as a strategy, right? Because we can reason about the composition. In machine learning, we follow a much more sciencey kind of reasoning that you might know from experimental physics, inductive reasoning, where you have observations and you generalize from them. You try to identify rules in data. That's also how machine learning works. And it's a very, very different way of thinking about the world. You don't get guarantees. In software engineering, we actually see both forms of reasoning in different stages. In software engineering, we tend to have a requirements engineering phase where you go from all the problems in the world that many different users with conflicting interests have, and you come up with specifications. And the question that you're asking is, is this specification meeting your needs? Is this product, if we're building it this way, good enough or useful for you, right? This is inductive reasoning, this is validation. But then for actually implementation part, we go from requirements and specifications to the code. There we use deductive reasoning. There we do testing verification approaches. There we ask, is the implementation correct? Does it meet the specification? Machine learning seems much closer to the requirements engineering side of things and the validation techniques that we're using there. We should much more ask ourselves, not is a model correct? but is a model useful? Does it make sense for the needs of our customers? So if the only thing that you take away from all of this is that machine learned models are unreliable functions, that's a great approximation. And I think that's a good way to think about this. And this lack of specification and having unreliable function has all kinds of downstream consequences. It breaks modular reasoning. We can't easily divide and conquer because we don't have clear interfaces. Information hiding doesn't work the same way because we can't hide things again behind clear interfaces. It challenges quality assurance because unit testing is way less powerful. We need to test more, much more at the system level. If you have an unreliable function, how do you reason about safety of a system when you have this part of the system that may make mistakes all the time or reason about fairness? 
And it's really challenging to work with teams where different members of the team have very different way, ways of thinking. But again, to be fair, we should indicate that we didn't need machine learning to build low quality, harmful and unethical software. We've been perfectly fine doing this without. But machine learning and this challenge of working more with unreliable functions, I think makes it much harder to give any confidence in software systems and we need to work harder to build good systems. It's easier to make mistakes. Unfortunately, I think in the machine learning community and many teams that try to build products with machine learning neglect the system view a lot. You see this also in a lot of talks that are really model centric when they talk about ethics, when they talk about building systems and challenges in building systems. If we want to build products with machine learning components, we need to understand the system. We need to understand the system goals, the requirements engineering, and how the system interacts with the environment, the world and the machine, these kind of things. Then we can start thinking about how do we design the system in terms of components and integrate them. And this will involve machine learning and non-machine learning parts, but we want to build the system. That's the end goal here. And this is an interdisciplinary endeavor. We need people who understand the machine learning part, who can operate it, who can build components and so on. So we need this system thinking. And mistakes can cause harms. Just to give you one example of how traditional engineering in this field is, and research is very model centric again. Um, there's a lot of discussion around machine learning safety and machine learning security that boils down to questions about robustness. You may have seen examples like this, where you take an image, you add some noise, often invisible, and then the machine learning model with very high confidence gives a completely wrong answer, right? So you can attack systems this way. This is a silly example, but this seems a bit more serious. People have shown how you can attack stop signs or can attack the uh, object detector that would detect the stop sign to detect with a few stickers in the sign, detect this as a speed limit sign, not a stop sign. And if you're trying to build a car, a self-driving car that relies on this object detection mechanism, you might not stop at the intersection and it could be quite dangerous. So researchers have jumped on this and looked into why does this happen with machine learning models and how can we harden our systems? And a lot of discussions happen around robustness. Let me give you some illustration of how robustness thinking goes. So you have a classifier, something that distinguishes, for example, stop signs from non-stop signs. And you have this image here that's clearly detected as a stop sign. But what you wanna do with robustness is you wanna see in this neighborhood all similar images with certain modifications, certain noise. You can flip a few pixels, you can rotate the image. You want to get the same prediction. In this case, there are some modifications like these stickers that would result in a different prediction. So you could say that this individual image, the original image, is not robustly predicted as a stop sign. And there's a huge amount of research on robustness. Partially, I think, because there's actually a formal specification, a formal invariant here that you can test for, that you can reason about formally. Many strategies have been explored, including formal verification, where people use SMT solvers in creative ways, or do a lot of samples, like 10,000 samples, to get probabilistic guarantees in the neighborhood. Um, lots of research around this. Lots of progress also of hard, how to harden models. But it doesn't really help us when we're building a system necessarily. We still need to make a decision. So this prediction is not robust. What do we do now? Do we stop the car? Do we not stop the car? Are there any mitigations beyond the model that we should consider? For example, how about a map that knows where all the stop signs are? But a map wouldn't help with all cases like a mobile stop sign like this. A lot of research also looks into whether models are robust rather than individual predictions, which is essentially looking at averages over many, many different inputs of whether those are robust or important inputs. A more robust model has fewer points that are near decision boundaries, but what does it actually mean about safety? Does this help us to build safe systems? In the end, I think we still need to except that incorrect predictions will be inevitable, even in models that are more robust. You can't achieve full robustness because you have a decision boundary somewhere. 
So if you're trying to actually build a system, you need to answer lots of questions that go beyond just reasoning about the model. Is model robustness actually meaningful to achieve safety in the system? Or how much does it contribute? What do you do if a prediction is not robust? Robust against what in the first place, right? Robust against rotation, robust against uh, individual pixel flipped. You need to understand how the system interacts with the world. Again, the world and the machine. What, are, what is the interface? What are the, the inputs? How can an attacker manipulate them to actually make some meaningful decisions here and reason about safety? You can't do this at the model level. Um, and then you have massive runtime overhead. I've shown you that these predictions use SMT solvers. In a self-driving car right now, you're doing inference at real time on specialized hardware. They can't afford running every inference 10,000 times, not even two times, right? Um, so when do you check for robustness? How, right? If you have a model that has, or if you have a system that has 20 different models, do you check robustness for all of them? And what alternatives do you have maybe to robustness? Maybe we shouldn't just focus on robustness. Safety in the end is a system property. Software itself is not unsafe. A model itself is not unsafe. But how a system interacts with the real world can be unsafe. So since safety is a system property, we need to understand how the system interacts with the world. We need to anticipate mistakes and mitigate them. And this mitigation will often happen outside the model. Not exclusively, more robust models can help. Robustness can be a building block, but it can't be the only thing that we're talking about when we're talking about safety. And it often, unfortunately, is. And this is literally true for every single property that people discuss as ethical AI, um, or responsible AI engineering, safety, reliability, security, fairness, inclusiveness, transparency, accountability, and so on. They are all system properties. You can't mitigate them or assure them all exclusively at the model level or at the pipeline level. You need to think about the entire system. And in practice, what we see a lot, not in every organization, but a lot is that people get excited about machine learning, understandably so. And then they have a prototype of a model that seems exciting, and then they try to build a product around it, but they have very little planning at that point, very little engineering uh, skills that they bring in. And this ends up in bad systems with inefficient operation, where they're running way too slow, way too expensive. Um, no monitoring, which leads to poor user experiences, unsafe operations, unsafe systems. And we see many examples of those that just come from poor engineering practices. So in the end, we need a system view. We need to understand the entire system, not just the ML components. We need the system viewed for responsible engineering. We can't do this at the component level. But we also need to bring in the expertise. We need to understand what robustness can contribute. We need to bring different people together. So what can we do about this? First, let's hear a word from our sponsor. I need to mention briefly that if you're interested in software engineering research, we have an exciting PhD program at Carnegie Mellon. Right? We do research in software engineering for machine learning, machine learning and software engineering, and many other topics. We accept applications every fall. So if you have students that are interested or you yourself are interested, please come and apply. I also have a postdoc opening and performance modeling more. So if, if you're interested in that kind of thing, email me. In Pittsburgh alone, we have 17 faculty in software engineering working on different topics and also lots of student staff um, building a nice community. And if you're coming to Pittsburgh next week, you can see many of them. But coming back to the talk. Right, so we, try, we need to focus more on the system level, but how can we do that? And I think that's where software engineers need to step up. We need to elevate the role of software engineers and we need to foster good engineering practices. Software engineers have decades of experiences in system engineering and building these kind of things, right? We have lots of discussions on process, development life cycles, requirements engineering, safety engineering, software architectures, quality assurance, and so on that can help us here that are desperately needed. The way that I'm thinking about this is that traditionally, 
there's without machine learning, there's a whole range of software systems and we don't use the same methods to build all of them. The bulk of the systems that we're building, like the XC Conference web page, is not super critical. It's not super complex, not super risky. We can get away with pretty sloppy practices there. But sometimes we build really complex, really high risk uh, systems like nuclear power plants or space probes or things like this that need to be correct. And we have very good methods for doing this. It's just expensive, right? We don't usually need the expensive methods or we don't usually use them. We get away with um, like simpler practices most of the time. With machine learning, what I think is happening is that we're really pushing the boundary. We're trying to do way more ambitious things and we do so with unreliable components, which is just so much harder, right? There's so many things that we can't do quite as easily anymore. And also a lot of software that we're building because of all of this is much more risky. Like photo search seemed to be something super trivial or non-risky, right? But I've shown you the example of how this can lead to discrimination if your model is really biased. Social media feeds have been shown to cause polarization and teenage depression. Is this something that we should have anticipated when we built them? Probably when we built those products. Is this something that we should do something about now that we know about it? Almost certainly. What we shouldn't do is just continue with sloppy practices that seem to be appropriate for harmless um, traditional software systems because a lot of these AI systems are not harmless. And this is where software engineering experience can really help. Yes, we need also new insights, but we have a lot of things to start with. To give you just some examples of how a software engineering view can help. Software engineers right, think most of you would agree, are often very explicitly trained in engineering and trade-off thinking. It's really about engineering judgments on the limited information, limited resources, and focusing on design and trade-off decisions and really dealing with the messiness of the real world where the customer doesn't always know what they want and they change their mind. Um, and we need to deal with the real world. Right? And we have typically many qualities that we care about, cost, correctness, performance, scalability, security, maintainability, and also accuracy, and we can't achieve them all. We need to make trade-offs. This is something that also machine learning people realize when they put systems into production. Here's an example that's fairly old now, the Netflix prize, the competition, where they try to come up with a better recommendation algorithm, and they had lots of great suggestions, but after looking at them, they decided to implement none of them because yes, they improve accuracy, but they also increase the engineering overhead, the maintenance overhead, the runtime cost, and it was simply not worth for the real product goals in this trade-off, right? So accuracy is not the only uh, goal in town that you need to optimize everything for. In software engineering, CMU in the master's program, we have this running joke that you can answer every single question with, it depends, right? There's always a trade-off involved, but the mark of a good software engineer is that they give them a concrete scenario, they can make an engineering judgment and tell you in this specific case, it depends on X and Y, and because of this, I would recommend this strategy, right? And we need to foster this kind of thinking. Software engineers also have a whole toolbox of different verification and validation and quality assurance techniques, and they work in different settings and they are optimized for different uh, scenarios. And we should use them appropriately, right? We should use the right methods in the right place. One thing that becomes super handy, I think, with more machine learning is all our advances in testing and production. A test automation, better testing, crash telemetry, A-B testing, chaos engineering, and all these kind of techniques that we have developed in the last maybe 20 years. Since we need to test much more at the system level, we can rely less on unit tests. We need to push for these things more, right? And we have a lot of experience to offer, but we need to invest when we're building these systems in monitoring, in telemetry, and so on. So that's why we need software engineers and we need to take them seriously when building these systems. We need the software wide view. Software engineers also have a lot of techniques for responsible engineering. We 
tend to teach safety and security as part of software engineering, right? Um, HAZOP is a really simple, fairly old hazard analysis technique where you just go through components of your system and think about what would happen if this went wrong and this went wrong. It's a guided brainstorming technique, but it helps you to anticipate mistakes and then think about mitigations, including technical architectures, but also including humans in the loop and so on. And there are many of these techniques, fall trees, FMEA, safety cases, and you almost never see them in systems with machine learning components, unless very few examples where it's really highly critical and people know this, like self-driving car companies. Here's an example uh, about safety cases there. But there's not a lot of safety engineering going on there, even though they're working with unreliable components, and we should change that. We will not be able to completely eliminate mistakes, but we can certainly anticipate many and avoid many. Another example in this area is that there's a lot of work on fairness in uh, AI. And I would argue that pretty much every single interesting question in this space, especially interesting to me, are requirements engineering questions. Yes, you can do some math at the model level, but what's really important and really hard is figuring out what are the protected attributes in the first place? What fairness goals should we go for? Which of the many notions of fairness is really the, the right one here? And they're mutually exclusive, so you actually need to work with stakeholders to figure out in the system what's the right notion here, and then integrate this into the process and think about fairness beyond just the model. So software engineers should really drive responsible engineering um, because they are at the center um, to do this kind of thing. But in the end, we cannot do it alone. We need to work together across disciplines. Um, we need the data scientists to build models. We need data engineers, domain specialists, operators, and so on. Sometimes you can wish for maybe we had more unicorns. That's a typical term given for people who unify all this expertise. And maybe there are some of them in this room, uh, but they are pretty rare. People who are really strong data scientists and software engineers and also know something about the domain and maybe even operations. Right? The more feasible strategy seems to be to build interdisciplinary teams. Right, where you hire people, software engineers, data scientists, and you make them work together. But to work together, they need to understand each other. They need to be able to work with each other. Right? They actually need to overlap. They can't be siloed off. I would argue that software engineers are actually at the center of a lot of these collaborations. We often already were. We needed to talk to safety and security experts, to operators, designers, and so on. We already were in the center, and now we also need to bring in data scientists um, into the fold. The way, to, the way that I think about this, um, the idea here is T-shaped professionals, which I think is a really powerful idea of how to think about how to educate people that they work in interdisciplinary teams. You want to avoid just having I-shaped professionals. So the students that are really optimizing for one field and they're a deep expert, let's say, in deep neural network architectures, but they haven't really looked left and right and they, they don't really appreciate other disciplines. Also, generalists, say managers, they know how to talk to everybody, but they can't make deep contributions uh, to one specific field. What you want are T-shaped professionals, people who are experts in one topic, say software engineering or machine learning or another one, but know enough of other fields that they can talk to them. They don't need to be a specialist in everyone, but enough have enough understanding that you can talk to the other people, that you understand their concerns, that you can work together. One success story where I think this has worked really well is DevOps culture in software engineering, right? Where you bring developers and operators who didn't always see eye to eye together and give them joint goals, joint responsibilities, joint tooling, where developers invest a little bit more effort in packaging their software in containers, for example, but then operators have an easier time and they can focus on making faster deployments, on providing more telemetry. So it's a win-win situation for both developers and operators, but they need to understand each other. And this is done by really working in the boundary, right? Setting joint goals, providing joint tooling, having joint vocabulary. This requires a culture change. This is not easy. This took many years, lots of consulting, and still many companies are struggling with this. But I think this is a role model 
And I would like to see something similar between software engineers and data scientists and other roles too. So we need software engineers to facilitate collaboration between disciplines. And I think the way to go there is through education. Yes, there are research problems, but I think we have a lot to do in education before we get there. And I think MSR is a perfect place to call for more education in this space, because I assume pretty much everybody in this room will have a background in software engineering and really appreciate software engineering, but also almost everybody in this room will know enough about data science and machine learning to hold a conversation and be taken seriously by a data scientist. Right. So you're probably all T-shaped, maybe even unicorns. You're in the right position to teach this kind of thing, teach the next generation of students to become T-shaped, to become good citizens and be the software engineers who can step up in this team. Right? We want to educate both T-shaped professionals in software engineering and in data science and probably in other disciplines too. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we can think briefly about what should a software engineer know about machine learning? Well, I think there are multiple things here, but the key things that we don't already cover in some way is machine learning as unreliable functions, inductive reasoning, accuracy, the kind of things that I've talked about, and also how to put machine learning in software architectures, be it ML ops or much stronger focus on monitoring and observability. And a lot of topics that we hopefully already teach, like testing and production, or working with weak specifications, ethics, or collaboration, um, can be pitched in a slightly different way. But my bias here, at least, is that I think most software engineers are already fairly T-shaped. We already assume that we will be in a very interdisciplinary field. Right? It's more about broadening the T a little bit. I think a lot of this can be done by reframing and enhancing existing software engineering courses, bringing in some software engineer, uh, some machine learning content in there. Um, and this can be done incrementally. We've done a number of changes to our undergraduate courses, and I've given a number of guest lectures in different graduate courses on architecture and quality assurance as well. I think there's room to kind of create nuggets here and make them make people more T-shaped and help them work with data scientists. On the machine learning side, I think this can be a little bit more tricky. A lot of students that specialized in machine learning, many of them come from other fields as well, uh, tend to very, very narrowly specialize on uh, machine learning. I think there are lots of things that we should try to cover. Again, we want T-shaped professionals. They don't need to be experts in all of these things, but they should have an appreciation. And I think there's a lot of things. First of all, they should appreciate that there is a model, a system beyond the model, right? That other people are thinking about UI design, safeguards, operations, things like this. That there is a role in importance of requirements engineering and tra engineering trade-offs between different qualities. It, if you happen to teach a machine learning course, I think you can nudge students to consider some of this by, for example, sometimes discussing how you would use a model into, in a product and what would it take to do this. But I think realistically, in many universities, this might be easier to uh, provide an additional course in the curriculum, make students take a software engineering course or provide an additional course here. And if you have one, there's many more topics that you can teach. At CMU, we've been fortunate that we could teach a specific course just at the intersection. We call it machine learning and production. And we have 28 lectures, so quite a lot of time to cover things. And we go through the entire software engineering life cycle. And we teach this both to software engineers and to data scientists. More data scientists take the course than software engineers. Um, we go through things like the importance of requirements engineering and safety engineering. We focus quite a bit on quality assurance beyond the model and at the model level as well, but also operations teams. And then a lot of lectures on responsible AI engineering, things like safety, fairness, interpretability, talking a little bit about what happens at the model level, but also how this would be used in a system level. We've now taught this five times, and I'm going to teach this again in the fall. Um, we're dealing with exploding enrollment. Again, I would like to see this or something like this also taught somewhere else. Maybe the interesting part here, one of the challenges that we face is who's really the target audience. And we settled in the end that 
we want mixed courses with both software engineers and data scientists. So we set it on really low minimal prerequisites. You just need to be able to do a little bit of programming and have ever seen a machine learning model before, then you're good to go in this class. And then we're trying to broaden the T, right? So we tend to go broad rather than deep in most places, but we also have some uh, specific engineering challenges. So we have a class project where we really want students to think about the engineering. Uh, we, build, we let them build a movie recommendation system, but they are actually providing recommendation in a virtual uh, simulated environment where there are actual feedback loops, there's actually security concerns and fairness concerns. And they actually need to deal with lots of qualities. Most students realize that their models are way too slow. Their latency is way too high to provide to just answer requests in time and deal with the number of requests that they're producing. And they really need to realize that, oh, they need to trade off latency with, um, with accuracy or other qualities in the system, right? So if any of this sounds interesting, if you're considering teaching, or even if you go out into industry, be the change there. There's lots of material, I think, that we provide that you can use. Um, there's all the course material, including slides, homeworks, including videos as well. We're trying to write a textbook on this. It's still in progress. ICSI organizations causing a lot of overhead. Uh, but we're maybe two thirds done, and I hope to finish this in the summer. And if you're more interested in the research side, I've read hundreds of papers in this area. I pick the ones that I like add some comments, try to organize them in this annotated bibliography. I think this would be a starting point. In the end, I think we need to teach this. There are research opportunities, yes, but we should start with teaching. So in conclusion, what I tried to tell you throughout this entire talk is that we should elevate software engineers and think about the entire system. We need the system-wide view. Machine learning is a component in a system. We need to think about the entire system. And software engineers need to be the one driving responsible engineering. You can't do this just at the component, at the model level. And we need to help with facilitating collaboration. I think the way to do this is through education. And I'm happy to discuss this for forever. I'm happy to take questions. And if you see me in person next week, also approach me. I'm happy to continue talking about this. Thanks. <laughs>